Hello, everyone. Welcome to this the Nisley Interactive Virtual Event. Um, can every can I have can you quick chat in the chat box if you can hear me? Okay, great. I'm seeing seeing some yeses. Wonderful. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, an official warm welcome to the final virtual event of the 2016-2017 academic year. My name is Signe and I work for the Nisley Interactive team at Iron USA. And we're so excited to for all of you to be joining us today. Uh, today's virtual event features three students on the Nisley Academic Year Program in Seoul, Korea. I'll take a quick minute to introduce your student presenters and we'll invite them to now turn on their webcams. Uh, the students that will be presenting today are Claire, Haley, and Nectarios. <laughs> The title of the event today is Project-Based Learning in Korea. So the students will be talking about their winter break and final projects. I'll give a brief overview of the event before turning it over to your speakers. Um, we'll begin with their presentations where, like I said, they'll share about the research and the projects they've been working on in Korea. And then we'll spend the second half of the event um, for the Q&A. So you're welcome to ask the speakers questions on their presentations or on the Nisli program in Korea. And we'll close the event with sharing just a couple Nisli resources if you'd like to learn more about the program. So without further ado, I will now turn it over to the Nisli students for their presentations. Thank you, everyone. Um, okay, so we're first going to start talking about what exactly the projects were. Um, we had two projects that we did, two main projects that we did throughout um, our NISUI experience. And the first one was the Winter Break Project. The Winter Break Project took place from January 6th to February 17th, and it was the main um, project, the main activity that we did throughout the two months of Winter Break. Um, during Winter Break, we didn't go to our host schools, so we did spend a lot of time um, on this project. And basically, we were asked to pick a topic to study in December, and then we were studying it during these two months. Um, it wasn't an individual project. It was actually a group project that we had to do with one other NISUI student, an American, and a Korean college student, which was a big aspect of the winter project, was working with a Korean student and forming a relationship with them. Um, we met every Tuesday and Thursday at um, from 10 to 12 a.m., two hours um, twice a week at a cafe, and we discussed basically a project, and we did a lot of work outside of those meetings as well, at home, and we would keep constant communication. Um, and part of this documenting of these meetings was a meeting journal that we did after every single meeting that we had to send to our program directors so they knew where our project was going so it was, we had a lot of support throughout the whole project, which really helped us shape um, our topics. We had a field trip budget for the field trip that we did um, about, we, most of us did our field trips at the end of January, end of January, early February. Um, so we had money to spend from the program to go, if there was a place that had some fee or something, um, we could go and use that field trip to learn more about our project. Um, we had to turn in a project proposal towards the beginning and then a rough draft and a final report towards the end. Our final report was our final project. Um, and then Claire, I'm going to hand it over to Claire to talk about the rest of the Interbrick project. Okay, yeah, so after the field trip we had a midpoint presentation where basically we kind of explained uh, what we have done so far. And it was just kind of a check-in point to make sure that we are all like on the same page and just making sure 
that our projects were going smoothly. And then finally, we had the final presentation. And so the final presentation, it, it wasn't any format you wanted. So some people did videos, others did interviews, some did, present, most did presentations actually. And so uh, the presentations could either be in English or Korean. A lot of people, actually most groups I think did a mix of both as like the supporters and the group members kind of just uh, tried their best um, to use both English and Korean in their projects. And then finally, we had a book that was put together. We all contributed a page to this book. And so inside this book, if we look inside. So this is actually my group's page. Um, we wrote, we all wrote a report and reflection on the project that kind of just summarized it and gave our thoughts and feelings on it and included a lot of pictures of our groups. And yeah, so that's just a basic overview of the Winter Break project. And I'll turn it over to Nectarius to talk about the, orient just briefly talk about the orientation and just the midpoint and final presentation. Winter Break project. Okay, so the orientation was basically after we po uh, chose our topics in de December, we just were waited, and the most known, the most known wracking part of the winter project was finding out who our Korean um, supporter was going to be. We called the college student supporters, basically because the program kind of set it up so that the one of the main parts of this winter project was our relationship with our Korean supporter because. It was kind of a big deal to work with a Korean college student in this academic area and we were kind of expected to get close to them throughout these two months. And so the program did some interviews with different college students and they ended, they ended up picking them and they placed us with college students. So at orientation we found out who our groups were. At the beginning it was kind of awkward, we kind of, it was the American students on one side, the Korean students on the other side, but they forced us to um, <laughs> like each other, I guess, by all these icebreaker games. As you can see, with these terrible, embarrassing photos, we did, like, human tables, and there was another game. Thank God there's not a picture, but it was... Everyone had to draw. We went around with, like, a piece of paper and a pen, and we had to walk up to a new person, give them one compliment, and then draw, like, one part of their face on their paper. And we all ended up with like different drawings of our faces and we were mostly really ugly but it was also really nice to have like a list of compliments on the back as well it was very funny and it helped us like push us to get comfortable with each other quickly because we got started on the project right away after the orientation um that january 6th was like a friday and we had our first meeting on like the next tuesday um and at orientation, the final thing we did after all the games was we got together with our group and we kind of discussed what our, we had already just picked our topics, but we discussed with a Korean student what our expectations were. We came up with group names um, and we just set the tone for the rest of the two months. And then we got started for the next two months and we did all the activities that we mentioned above, field trips, weekly meetings, and our final project. And the final project was like the official, um, culmination of all of our studies, but we also had a final presentation at the end of the project, which was um, less important like academically, but it was just a nice way to, for all of us to gather again and share what we had learned with the other students. And by this point, like all of the groups were kind of actually um, used to each other because we had met again for like another thing. So it was like one really big, nice group. Um, and personally, at the final presentation, I was able to talk about my project in Korean. I gave a presentation about this complex academic topic in Korean, which is a really good way for me to practice my language and to do it in front of a bunch of Korean students. Um, so I really liked the final presentation and the fact that it gave me this platform to speak Korean. And that was pretty much it for a winter project. And then we, after the final presentation, we went out for chicken and we said goodbye to our supporters, but we had, we gained this wealth of knowledge in this one specific subject, and also this great relationship with our Korean supporters. And that was it.
Yeah, and so in the NISLI program, there are two uh, projects that we have to complete. complete. The first is the winter break project, and the second is our final project, which we're actually in the middle of finishing right now. And so the final project is basically accumulation of our experiences and our interests in Korea, both language-wise and culture-wise. And so just like the winter break project, we proposed and chose our own topics. And similarly, we went on a field learning trip and we have to complete some sort of final um, report or something that we can turn in as proof of our learning. Um, but I think the big difference between the winter break project and the final break project, uh, the final break, the final project is that first the final project is an individual project. And so uh, we don't uh, go on uh, all these meetings and nothing is really set as in the, there's no, like monitoring for, oh, after every meeting, what have you done and like what goals will you set for the next meeting? And so it is a lot of more respons run <laughs> responsibility on yourself to complete it. And yeah, and second of all, we're actually attending school right now while finishing this project. And so it is a lot, it's a lot busier of a time. And so I think finishing this final project definitely is just teaching us how to manage our time and yeah, continue researching on our own. And so now I will move on to talking about my personal winter break project. We each prepared our own presentations about um, either our winter break project or final project. And so for my winter break project, I researched about Korean pottery. And so in the upper left hand corner, you can see um, this is our team sign, which is omji tok, which means the thumbs up. And under it, it says ihan tokagi wie. So in order to make it sound like we understand what we're talking about, we give a thumbs up. And that was our team name. And uh, the bottom left is our uh, group picture. The so Heather, who is a fellow Nislian, she's on the left. I'm on the right, and then our Korean college supporter is in the middle. And then just on the right is a nice picture of a happy Korean pottery piece. And so um, our group's topic was basically the making process and cultural history of Korean pottery. And so we basic our, we split our topic into two parts. So first is the three different types of Korean pottery. So you can see the pictures on the bottom. The one on the far left, the one on the far left is called Punto. And it's the oldest uh, form of, I guess, Joseon Dynasty Korean pottery. So Joseon Dynasty is the last Korean dynasty, I think, so you could call it. Yeah, and so Funcheong <laughs> um, is very well known for its brown glaze and its special um, engraving technique, which is called Samga. And so um, through that technique, they're able to uh, really make really beautiful designs and really innovative in that field of um, pottery and like that sort of design. And then in the middle is called, oh, tong, sorry. <laughs> it's called, in English, it's called Saladin. In Korean, it's called, sorry, I'm having a huge brain fart right now. Tongsa. Anyways, uh, this is probably the most famous, the most famous type of Korean pottery, just because it is so unique compared to any other country's forms of pottery. And so we researched a lot about the form of tongja and um, the different designs and their meanings. And lastly is white porcelain, which in Korean is called pekja. And yeah, and. The interesting thing about Pekta was that it was a lot, it was related with Confucianism and the philosophy that simple, the more simple something is, the better it is. And so Pekta is really notable for how colorless, not just colorless, but how beautiful the, the beauty in its simplicity, in the fact that it has no color and it relies simply on the form of the pottery to be beautiful. And yeah, and then so on the right, um, it shows, 
is pho a Photoshop picture, <laughs> but it shows Heather standing on top of Ongi. And so our second, the second part of our topic was the cultural history part. And so Ongi are the containers, the containers used, um, they're still used today, they're used from a very long time ago, 2000 BC, I believe, to ferment kimchi and basically make it basically innovated Korean's food culture become uh, the way it is today. So kimchi and uh, ganjang, which is soy sauce, and those sorts of things that rely on ferment fermentation are all related to the ongi. And then last of all, we also researched how um, Korean pottery has related to different wars actually in Korean history, such as the Japanese invasions, which were actually called the pottery wars. and so. Just stuff like that, and that was our topic. And so for our field trip, we went to d three different places. So first we went to Itan uh, Ceramics Village, and actually we first went because the description of the place was more like, oh, there's still potters uh, baking traditional pottery there, and it's actually a very historical site um, back in the Joseon Dynasty because a lot of government um, like potters who work for the government work there, but disappointingly it was kind of touristy, but we got a lot of pictures um, and videos there, which was really important because our final, uh, the final report, the final report or product that we were baking was a video series. And so the whole goal of our field trips actually was to gather um, pictures and videos so that we could include it in our final video. And so our second uh, field trip was to a place nearby uh, Itan Ceramics Village to a place called Serapia. And so there we interviewed a potter um, and asked her about her thoughts on traditional pottery and especially how it relates to the younger generation because our focus was on how to appeal this sort of traditional craft to a younger generation in which the interest in this sort of thing is declining. And we also got a hands-on experience on making pottery by ourselves. And then thirdly, we went to the National Museum of Korea and there, um, at the National Museum of Korea, there was a huge pottery exhibition. And so there we got to see a lot of really famous and really representative pieces of uh, the three different types of pottery. And so that was really cool to see what we've been researching in person. Yeah. <laughs> and then, so like I mentioned earlier, we made a video as our final project. Uh, we actually made three videos. The first was a trailer for our, uh, we made like this acting video where we had this little skit. And so it was the trailer for that. The second was a science video that explained the making process of the three different types of, uh, the three different types of Korean pottery and their different specialties because to make each single one it had a very unique process and so we want to show that through the science making video. Um, and then the third video was our skit and basically the skit, um, I won't spoil it, but <laughs> it basically just showed the different aspects of cultural history that I mentioned earlier such as the ongi and the pot, a pottery's connection to the war. And so now, um, if we could take a moment um, and watch the trailer video, it is a minute long. And if you look down in the chat box below, uh, Signy has linked it below. And if you want to watch that, please do so. And we will uh, resume in two minutes. Okay, so now we will resume. And <laughs> thank you for watching the video. I'm Glad to see all the positive comments about it. And so now um, I will be turning the mic over to Nectario, who will be talking actually also about his winter break project. Or actually, wait. <laughs> Possibly Haley, Victorious. Okay, yes. 
Okay, so I'll be turning the mic over to Victoria's now. Hello, everyone. Sorry for the te technical difficulties. Um, so we're going to get started here. Did two projects, obviously, the winter break project and the final project. But today, I'm just going to talk about my final or my winter break project. Um, my winter break project was about elderly poverty in Korea. Um, and this was originally I was put in a group. Originally, for the winter project, we were all put in very broad groups, broad topic groups. And my group was the economy group. I had chosen this topic. And I was grouped with another American student named JP and a Korean college student, um, Tongun. Um, but as we like delved further into this topic, well, much more than just the economy, it had a lot to do with Korean society, Korean culture, um, Korean politics as well. So we got to study a lot of different aspects of Korean culture. Um, so the problem of elderly poverty in Korea, elderly poverty is a problem in a lot of countries, but specifically how I found about um, the sort of crisis that exists in Korea is this one day I was on Wikipedia reading about like different qualities of life. And amongst like, the OECD countries, which are considered to be the most developed countries, Korea has a considerably high elderly poverty rate. Um, and so I was kind of shocked. If you look at this statistic from the OECD, it says that 49.6% of elderly Koreans are below the poverty line. So that means that basically like one in every two elderly Koreans you meet is poor, which is like a stunning statistic when you think about how modern and how strong Korea's economy is. Um, so I was curious, like, what, what is this gap caused by? Um, if you look for reference, the next highest elderly poverty rate in OCD countries is in Australia, and it's at 35%. So that's like 15% lower than Korea. Um, and so that's why there is this term about Korea called, basically calling the elderly generation like the forgotten generation. Because as Korea has developed and become this modern country, there are still so many people that are poor and they haven't benefited from this development. So I started out this project basically with the intent to find out what exactly the problem was, what caused the problem, and then maybe if I could like postulate some solutions through my research um, based on the conversations with other people as well. So the way that we went about studying this was what I just said. Basically, we first gathered statistics, um, and we had to gather statistics that weren't related explicitly to poverty. So we found other statistics, like, um, for example, amongst South Korea's 6.4 million elderly um, population, only 2 million of them are employed. Uh, this statistic is like considerably to other countries. In other countries, a lot uh, bigger percent of older people are employed. But in Korea, there's a lot of ageism that older people face. Um, Employers don't really want to hire older people because of stereotypes against how they will do and if they're not worth hiring. So a lot of Koreans are shut out of the workforce. Um, another statistic that we found was that amongst elderly Koreans, the depression rate is at almost 80%. And the related um, suicide rate is 81 in every 100,000 elderly Koreans. And again, compared to other countries, these are really high rates. So um, looking at these statistics told me that it's not really just an elderly poverty issue per se, um, and more of like a quality of life issue for elderly Koreans, because they're affected by so many issues. Um, and next, we kind of had to look into Korean history to see what the cause of this, um, these multiple problems were. And we found that like Korea's rapid development was a huge issue. The development from a like relatively small farming country, um, it was a really poor country 50 years ago at the start of the Korean War. And the development from that 
to the country that it is today, this super modern, um, high standard of life, high income economy, in just 50 years, um, has a lot to do with the current situation with other people in Korea. Because if you think about the time that it took other countries to do this progression, in the United States, it was of industrialization, gradually going from like one society into the society that we have now. But in Korea, since it only took 50 years, it didn't take generation by generation, but it just basically was a one generation process. The older generation that wasn't the advanced college educated um, generation was still alive and they're still alive today. Um, these, this generation didn't go to college. A lot of them didn't go to college. Um, so they're not educated and they can't get these high level, uh, like office level jobs. Um, they also don't have savings because 50 years ago, no one really saved in Korea because of the problem related with Korean culture. In the Korean culture, it's in the in past Korean culture, it was expected that um, children take care of their parents. And so parents didn't really think that they had to save for retirement or anything because it was naturally expected that once they got old, they could just rely on their children to take care of them. But because everything suddenly changed and now a lot of children don't want to take care of their parents, so they don't have the time to take care of their parents. And on the opposite side, parents don't want to be a burden to their children and they want success. But this need for success is kind of making them forget their own needs and so they're left alone and without financial or emotional support. Um, and so this cultural economy problem um, kind of explained a lot. Also, Korea's social security system is really new, and there's a lot of older people that aren't on social security, so they're not receiving any money from the government at all, and they have zero income. So they have a lack of savings, a lack of income, and basically it's like, how are they supposed to live if they have nothing? Um, so after we found out, we basically, how do these causes, and we wanted to talk a lot about all of them, but something that we realized, and something that a lot of the other groups realized too, is that our projects ended up being really, our ambitions were really big in the beginning, but it became very hard to put those, to manage those and try to fit them into our projects. So we had to cut down on a lot of the history aspect of our project um, because we also wanted to have like a current um, view on the problem and we wanted to be able to include the solutions. So for a current look at the problem, we did for a field trip, an interview at a real welfare center in Incheon. Incheon is the city um, right next to Seoul. And so we decided to get in touch with social workers in direct contact with Korea's elderly every single day and ask them about their personal encounters and their thoughts about elderly poverty. Um, and this was a really insightful way to see, to hear stories, for example, about elderly people that have no contact outside of the social workers. In some cases, because the social welfare center does a lunchbox delivery program, so in some cases, besides that once a weekly meeting with a lunchbox, the elderly person saw no one else. Um, or in another case, they have found elderly people that were in a low, they had um, been in their apartment alone and they died because they had no one else. Um, at the time of their death, and so they found them days after they had passed away. And hearing those types of situations really put a perspective on what the problem is. And another great part of this interview was that we did it all in Korean. It was nine questions in Korean, and it took about an hour, and it was a great way for us to practice our language skills. And it was honestly the first time out of the whole program that I felt like I had gotten past this elementary level of Korean and I was able to use my language skills in a really purposeful way because I was talking about these very complex issues, I was having dialogue with the workers back and forth, I was able to understand like 80% of what they were saying which blew me away at the time. So it was a really good way for language practice. And this is a picture of us doing the interview. Um, they gave us a little tour of the social welfare center afterwards. 
And coming back from that, we use those questions to help come up with our final conclusions. Um, so one into it, basically, I've already talked about um, what Korea's epidemic is and what the causes are. And then our future solutions that we talked about were spreading awareness amongst younger Koreans, because a lot of younger Koreans, first of all, don't even know about this crisis. As I said earlier, a lot of elderly people don't want to reach out to someone, um, not because they're too proud or just because they don't want to be a burden on anyone. So the younger generation needs to have more care about this issue. Um, there's a lot of talk in the Korean government right now about changing the social security system because it's just unsustainable. And there's a lot of people that don't have access to the types of welfare centers that we went to um, because we live in the countryside and there's not a lot of population. So giving just resources to these elderly people um, is something that we found could really help them in the future. And that was my winter project. I'm really grateful that I studied this and I know now about this pro about this problem in detail and it was great for my language helped me get closer with Korean culture definitely now I'm gonna pass it over to our final presentation um, which is Haley we need to do a little bit backtracking here and then Haley's gonna take over Ooh. thank you for listening presentation or my final project for Nestle and so what was my final project so my I did my final project on Sasong constitutional medicine and so it's a theory that separates humans into four, four different constitutions based on hypo active and hyperactive functions in their body and so, so the key ideas are if congenital shortcomings are, are controlled well then the healthy state of the body can be accomplished so this pretty much means that if they can keep the hypo and hyperactive functions in the body balance, then they can prevent predisposed illnesses from occurring. And so continuing on, the herbs and remedies belonging to the Constitution cannot be used for other consti constitutions, otherwise this might lead to adverse results. So in the adverse responses, to a specific medicine or herb are not temporary but congenital. So the reason why I chose this as my final project was that I, when in, in Korea, when you first come, it's surprising how much they how often they go to the doctor even for small, small things like a cold they'll go to the doctor which was very different from what we have in the US where you don't usually go to the doctor until you're sick and so I really like this idea of prevention over treatment which is one of the key ideas in Sasa constitutional medicine and Korean medicine in general and so for that reason I chose this final project the idea of prevention over treatment so the four constitutions are Taeyang which is the greater Young, so Young, which is the lesser Young, Taeum, which is the greater Yin, and Soum, which is the lesser Yin. And so, so the person who created this was a 
traditional Korean practitioner called Yi Jema, and he actually based his this constitution off of the traditional Chinese five constitution theory when he postulated that the yin yang the perfect balance constitution did not exist and that the Chinese version of this was not practical for use of treatment or any sort of practical use. So he created this this theory with four constitutions and he actually made it practical for treating people and he actually made mind and body diet and medicinal herb theories related to this. And so as you can see, when we were talking about the hyper and hypoactive functions, so each each constitution is has their own hypo and hyperactive functions, and the main idea is that if they can keep this teeter totter in balance, then they'll be able to establish a healthy healthy body in this constitution. So for each each constitution, they have a different hypo and hyperactive function. And then moving on to my final project field trip, I went with my Korean supporter from winter break project and it was really nice going with her and we went to the Seoul Herb and Medicine Museum and the the, the um, medicinal it's called Hanyak Korean traditional medicine is called Hanyak and it's, it's the actual the market district for selling Korean traditional medicine ingredients and Korean traditional medicine. So it's this big market. And so at the museum, we, we, were, tour we were given a tour by one of the curators. And, and she's talking about, she started talking a lot about Sasong typology or constitutional medicine and how it was related with Korean traditional medicine. And so, as you can see on the picture on the right is me with my Korean supporter from the Winter Break Project. The picture on the left is a picture of us with a few people who interviewed us about what our thoughts were on. Then after Thank you so much, Claire, Nectarios, and Haley, for your insightful presentations. I I think I can speak on all of us that we learned so much. Um, everyone, please feel free to use the chat box to ask our presenters questions about their presentations. I'm going to switch the view to discussion mode now. As soon as you go into the museum on the wall, there's this sentence that says, prevention over treatment. So the main idea of 
Hanyak, Korean traditional medicine, and Sasang constitutional medicine, is that if you can pre prevent it, it's better than being able to treat it. And so on, on the right, you can see one of the images that I took from about Sasang constitutional medicine. And so in Korean, it's called, called Sasang Daechil. And so it was actually, I was surprised at how much in the museum there was a lot of information about this Sasang constitutional medicine and how it's actually really deeply connected with Korean traditional medicine. Even though it was made relatively earlier, relatively soon. And so in the bottom left, if you can see there in the different types of ginseng and ginseng, I think we all, do we all know ginseng? And so, when we were talking to the curator of the museum, she was telling us about how only certain, only certain constitutions can use certain types of ginseng because of their cooling and heating properties. So, for constitutions that ha are more cool in body temperatures, they can't use the cooling ginseng ginseng with the cooling property. And so, I, I guess we could do this like one by one. So, okay, I'll just go first. Um, I, I'll be honest, personally, I didn't have a lot of the typical culture shocks about like everyday culture because I think I was already informed about a lot of things about Korean culture. Um, and a lot of culture shocks actually happened later in the year, not initial culture shock. Um, for me, one big culture culture and in a lot of ways, um, I didn't really realize, like, I didn't really see this culture shock until like a much later into this year until recently. Um, and if I'm being specific, the culture shock that I faced was the role of teachers in Korea. Um, and I think that, that the role of teachers in America and the role of teachers in, in Korea is different in that in, in Korea, it's or not, not exactly teachers. But rather, in the school setting, like the whole, I don't know if, any, if you guys might have heard of this idea before, but in America and in Korea, there is a difference in the fact that there's individualism in America. Basically, the fact that the idea that you as an individual are like the most important thing to yourself. And then there's this idea that called collectivism in Korea, which is that people are thinking not about themselves first, but about about how they affect a group, and that group could be the family or society as a whole or their school group. Um, and I happen to witness that collectivist idea through school. Um, and it was a shock for me. I was able to get over it. And, and yeah, I guess it just manifests in little ways like 
things you're not supposed to do, things. Okay, I will answer the question. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, like Dectarius, didn't really have like a huge culture shock because a lot, because before coming to Korea, you like research a lot like about Korean culture and just like all the manners, like, you know, when you look at the websites and you're like, oh, like, what can I do? What can I not do? That sort of thing. Not exactly. And like, so, what type of food do they eat? But rather, like, this huge shock at that point, it's more like, wow, like, um, um, philosophy that affects, like, parts of culture that you might not realize right away that I had to get used to. And not that it's a bad thing or, you know, necessarily any, you have to pass any judgment on it. You just, like, realize and you are very aware of how different it is. And so, mm -hmm. I had to give like one example that just like came to my mind. Um, it was like walking in Gangnam and seeing like all the like plastic surgery ads. And become before coming to Korea, I was very aware of like, um, prevalent it was, especially in like the Gangnam area, which is like the very rich area of Seoul. But like seeing that in person was a lot different and rather than culture shock it was more just like wow that is like i like knew it but i never really imagined or really thought um of like what it would look like so just like seeing like the people who had just got on the plastic surgery operation or like a few days later and like their faces are still swollen it's just it was it was just like oh like you can um at that moment, you become very aware of how different um, the cultures are. And that, that's not necessarily saying that's bad, but it's just like, it's just, there's a difference. And yeah. Function of the body in order to maintain a balance is the part you have to focus focus on and so what Korean doctors will do is, is they'll see your your, your um, constitution type and then based on what constitution you are they'll look at, at those 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 hypoactive those shortcoming functions of your body and they will prescribe medicines based on one of that on that to maintain a balance so it works like a teeter totter so in order to maintain a balance they have have to control those shortcomings in order to prevent predisposed illnesses that answers the question. Okay, next question. What is the most difficult part of, of completing these projects for you guys? Um, first, I think the challenges were different between the winter project and the final project. So I'll just talk about the challenges I'm having right now in the final project. Um, it's basically just, just like so we had to narrow it down to the three kind of hard because I'm basically talking about a topic that's 
already like all the facts are already established on this topic it's a historical topic so i'm not really i'm just collecting all these facts and i'm like saying what happened the past that we're kind of expected to have some analysis at the end or some sort of like create some new idea so that's kind of been a hard part for me um but it also has been like kind of really rewarding to put in that effort and try to really think and try to come up with my conclusion and so coordinating all that and making sure that it was all pulled together by the end through all the technical difficulties too that was probably just like a very specific like unforeseen challenge that we faced but it was worth it in the end because the video turned out really nicely <laughs> That's true. And also, uh, to answer the follow-up question, uh, and then we'll get to Carla's question. Um, so, how much of the research th that you did, how much of it was conducted in Korean? Um, so, uh, yeah. So, for the winter break project, um, our supporter was really good at English. He studied abroad and like lived in Australia for two years etc so he was basically fluent in English but during our meetings we spoke a mix of Korean and English like if we spoke Korean to him he would, he would respond in Korean and if it got too hard like if um, our discussion got to like the topic or what we want to express but got too difficult for us to express in Korean we did it in English and so that was just the way our group did it some groups did it all in Korean depends on your group and as far as the research um, um, we did our I think Heather and I did our research we did it in English but then our supporter did it in Korean and so we also had to like read his research and so it was for our group it was more like a bilingual effort especially because you have no school during the winter break project and then you have to do with school during the final project so and how much effort you're really willing to either keep it all Korean or bilingual. So next, Carla's question. Someone would like to <laughs> answer. Mm. Mm. So for the winter break project, it'll be easier to like manage your time because every week you're going to be meeting twice. But 
for the final break project, if you let it, it will get out of hand and it won't be done until the week before you have to turn it your midpoint PowerPoint or whatever. So you really have to manage your time wisely. That's probably the hardest part for the final project. Okay, perfect. Yeah, so I will quick answer, well, just Carla's question. Um, so about learning, the experience learning uh, or adjusting to Korean culture and learning the language. Um, so everyone definitely has very different experiences. I want to stress that. So if I were to talk about my personal experience, um, as far as language learning, just the way I learn language, it's very like audio based. Um, for me, it was through like conversational speaking and just like listening to the people around me that really helped me pick up the language, but that's very different for every single person. And as far as adjusting the culture, it's just, I think, like I said before, just being very aware um, of that there will be differences because it's a different culture, but making sure that you're not passing judgment on them or necessarily um, being very like American centric or very um, super, like have any superiority complex about your own culture, and so I think that was just. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay, like final thoughts, I guess. Really quickly to Patrick's question, I cannot pick like a most memorable part, memorable part of it. Like, it's just it's too much. <laughs> There's so many memorable parts of this year, to be honest. And I'm really grateful. Um, in regards to this presentation about our project based learning, um, I'm really grateful that these projects exist because it's a really good way to go beyond like the service level of Korean culture that we do. Like it's not just whatever music or like eating some food. It's really getting involved with Korean culture and um, learning about it. So it brought me closer to Korea, I think for sure. So I'm really grateful that we had these experiences. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone. I'm going to pull up our final slide of the PowerPoint just to share um, a couple of resources on Nisli for those of you who would like to learn more about the program. Um, the first site is the official Nisli website, nisliforyouth.org, that has all information on the Nisli program, including how to apply. And then the second site is Nisli Interactive, which features stories from current students and alumni about their Nisli experience. We have recorded this event and we'll be sharing the recording on Nisli Interactive within the next couple weeks. So for anyone who is not able to attend, they can uh, visit the site and watch the recording. 
A huge thank you to our Nisli speakers, Nectarios, Claire, and Haley. You guys did a fantastic job, and we're so grateful. And, and best of luck in your final month of your program for the academic year. It's so exciting, and, and we can't wait to see the learn about your final projects and how those all turn out. And thank you to everyone who was able to attend today. Um, again, we're so grateful. And um, yeah, we have a wonderful rest of your day and evening, everyone. Thank and you so much. Thank you again.